Hi folks, I'm Anthony with Two Guys Ride, and today we are here with Randy, and Randy has got uh, an awesome car right behind us, so tell us what it is. This is a 1957 Chrysler 300C convertible, one of 484 originally made. Only 484, and on top of that, this is all original. This is all original. There's wow. been very few fingerprints on this car other than Chrysler employees when they built the car. <laughs> Man, so what number owner are you? I'm the third owner of this car. Uh, I don't know the name of the first owner, but I bought it from the second owner who owned this for at least 40 years. Oh, so almost the whole life of the car. I mean, almost, that's, yeah. That's for the bulk of it anyways. He so. bought it uh, He bought it early on in, uh, in the 60s, as I recall. There's, there's oil change stickers on the door edge uh, okay. that, that kind of give you some clues as to the history of when it was getting oil changes, so when it was last driven and things like that. Okay. Now, when you found the car, was the guy still currently driving it or was it stored somewhere? No, he had passed away. The, the second owner of this car, the guy that owned it for all those years, he had it and he drove it for a while and a lady bumped him in the front bumper and just pushed the front corner of the bumper where it wraps around the fender, yep. just pushed that in a little bit. And he was so upset that he drove it home and he said to his son, that's it. I'm going to put this away. I'm never going to drive it again because I don't want to give anybody a chance to run into this car ever again. Oh, and he, man. he put it up on blocks in his garage and there it sat for years and years and years until he passed away. Okay, so how did you find out? I mean, how, how do you find something like this? Well, this is the interesting part of the story is I also have uh, another uh, show car, uh, Chrysler 300F convertible, and I was taking it to the Milwaukee Concorde d'Elegance in 2017. When I signed up, I sent him pictures of my car and... Uh, and the lady called me up from the Concours and said, do you mind if we use your picture of your car in the local newspaper to promote our car show? It's so beautiful, I've never seen anything like that. And I said, right, go ahead. Well, this fellow, this, the son of this fellow that owned this C then, ended up with this newspaper in his mailbox <laughs> and a picture of my car and my name and that I was bringing it to the Concours. Right. Well, and he was trying to sell this C because he just didn't have any interest in it. And so he called the Milwaukee Concord, <laughs> talked to this woman and said, hey, what's that guy's name and phone number? And long story short, he ended up, uh, she gave me his name and phone number okay. and said, you might want to call him. So I thought, okay, and the only message I got was, this guy has a car he'd like to sell and wants to talk to you. And I thought, oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> Here we no, go. <laughs> no indication of what it was. No indication. Okay. So I was in a good mood and bored one afternoon, so I decided <laughs> I would call him up and see what he's got. So he starts talking, and he says, well, it's this 1957 Chrysler 300C convertible. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. You're sure about that? You're not just saying something or do you understand what you're talking about and how rare and how you know like that and he goes oh I know what I've got he goes that's what I've got and so I tried to play it cool and I said well you know maybe in the next few weeks maybe I can find a way to get out there and look at it and then I hung up the phone and I said to my girlfriend I said pack your bags we're gonna go right now <laughs> <laughs> so, so off you went off we went and looked at this car and uh, we came to an agreement on the price and I just couldn't even believe my good luck, but what a fantastic car. Well, so. and, and especially, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll go around the car and talk about it, but for being an original condition, that's just crazy. Yeah, it's, it's all, it has the original factory installed convertible top that's still soft and pliable and in good shape. The factory installed interior, dash, gauges, all that. Now this car also had a factory installed highway hi-fi. Now that's an under the counter, under the dash record player. The highway hi-fi is a record player made just for Chrysler and it turns at 16 and 2 thirds RPM. Which is slower than normal record players. Exactly. So it'll play for a long time on one side of the record. 
which means you have to have special records for it. You have to have special records, correct. And you have a couple of those. I have the whole set. Well, here's what also is funny about this car. Not only it had a factory installed Highway Hi-Fi, which now is not in there right now because it wasn't working, and so I sent it to get it repaired. Okay. But when I opened the trunk, there was two NOS Highway Hi-Fis in the box that had never been used, and a complete set of records uh, about, well, a complete set would have been 36, I believe. Okay. I have about 28 of them still wow. in the factory built leather bound <laughs> container box with a little lock with the keys. Oh my gosh. And <laughs> it was absolutely incredible. Isn't that those, those little gems that you find afterwards you didn't really even realize, but some of that would be incredibly hard to get. It, almost impossible. Almost impossible. The records Here, the come trunk. up on eBay once in a while for sale, and they usually go between a fifty and a hundred dollars a piece. The little box that they originally came in uh, that I have—it's really an item that is quite extraordinary. When you pulled it out of the shed, what did you have to do to it to get it? I mean, you must have had to at least buff it out or do something we had to do a couple of things we had to, the brakes were uh, needed to be redone in the brake lines right uh, the gas tank we just replaced it because it had foul gas in it like ooh, it was nasty yep. we just replaced the gas tank and the gas lines we had to rebuild the carburetors okay we had to rebuild the radiator okay um, and those are all things that would I mean it would go on any car if it was sitting for that long yeah but what was interesting, it still does have the original fan belts, the original radiator uh, hoses <laughs> Are you serious? with all the original clamps. We didn't touch anything that we didn't have to touch. Okay. And when we got it home, I said to Michael, my restorer, I said, let's just hook a battery onto it and see how much of this stuff on this car even works. Well, almost everything, every light, every blinker, every, uh, the radio, the, uh, the turn signals, uh, the lights, the backup lights, everything, the top, uh, no, the top didn't work. We had to repair that. Okay. Uh, to go up and down. But pretty much everything on the car worked just the way it was supposed to. The yeah. horn tooted. <laughs> it's just amazing after all those years, you all can pull something of out of the, the garage and hook a battery to it and get it to do that. Oh, my yeah. gosh. We did a little work to get the top to go up and down. And then, like I say, the highway hi-fi, uh, the turntable wouldn't turn. So uh, I got that off. It'll get repaired. And then uh, and we got her all working. Yeah. Now, the uh, the chrome work on it, Yeah. How, that, that's, uh, that's just been buffed. Just been buffed, Has and oh, and that's by the way, we uh, we buffed the whole car. It was it was dirty and nasty and stuff like that. So. Well, I'm sure after 20 years, some years, 40 some years of sitting, well, 20 some years of sitting in the garage, of course it's gonna be that way. But it's just amazing that the paint is that good. Yeah, it it looks beautiful. I mean, this guy obviously, well, you can tell from the story that you shared that he really cared about it. So. I'm sure when he stored it, he tried to make sure it was protected as possible. But now the tires. Are those original? Oh, no. I, that I should mention, too. Yeah, we had to put new tires okay. on it, of and course. And you would just out of safety, right? You don't want to drive right. on cracked rubber, even yeah, though the tread might have been yeah, good. Yeah, they were all old and crusty and cracked and flat. and Yeah. But this is how it would have originally looked. Yeah. Yes, it is. Now, yours only 480-some made. 484, yes. 484 convertibles. Right. Man. How many more do you know of that are in existence? Well, uh, according year. to the Chrysler 300 International Club, um, as I recall, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, so, but I, I'm going to guess somewhere around 60 to 80 of them, something That's like it. that. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. I absolutely love not only that, the, the shape of the vinyl roof is, is nuts. I've had several convertibles, and I cannot believe the shape that's in. The stitching? Yeah. I mean, no holes, no tears. It's soft. It goes up and down. Yeah, just it's like supple. A yeah, I mean, it moves. Fantastic. <laughs> now the inside seats yeah. are the same way. I mean, you you touch those, yeah. and They're they soft. give. There's a nice soft. I mean, they've got some cracks in which you expect from age, but not the stiffness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that door is, panels are all in good shape. The the, the, uh, yeah, the silver door carts are in there. good shape. Man. The power seat works. Goes all six directions. This also has a power antenna. 
And okay. uh, it also works, yeah. Oh, really? The power yeah. antenna works? It sure does. Ah. Yeah. Ah. My guess is the guy never used it. I've never <laughs> seen a power antenna motor last that long. <laughs> but the man, the cards are nice on the doors. Yeah. And uh, now the dashboard, the pods in there. Yeah, they're just like brand new. That's the way they work. Yeah. And these no ones hazing, are in, no no hazing, cracking. no oh. cracking, no uh, no crusty, and they light up at night just beautifully. So so the lights behind them are still good. All work perfectly, every Man. single one. Yep. <laughs> All right, so right now we're sitting in the car. We can go over some of the actual buttons. So just to the right of the steering wheel, what is that big knob? Uh, this one. Yeah. That's the uh, blower for the heater. Okay. That's all it does. Yeah. Okay. And then, of course, you got your ignition. Yes. And that is all there is, right? There's not a push button on the floor or anything. It's not, I mean, you just turn the key to start it. Turn the key, and then you push the neutral button. Oh, really? Should I do it? Yes. Is this, it only turns to just that far. Okay, you can't. And then, uh... Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so, okay, the actual start of there, that turns it on, pressing neutral, and you didn't even have to put your foot on the brake. No. <laughs> <laughs> As you do in modern cars. They didn't have any of that silly nonsense Ooh, back that, then. That's got a good sound. Okay. So, I, I, I love the way, the way it starts, or the two-step process, but there must have been a reason why they had you push neutral when you started it. Yes, and that the reason for that is that it forces you to not have the car in gear when you start it, so okay. it doesn't take Makes off sense. on you. You have to push the neutral button so you are assured that it's in neutral. Yeah, before yeah. you start it. Yes. Okay, now, and then uh, there was no park position. Right, right. For the gear. So you had to set the emergency brake. Correct. Put it neutral, set the emergency brake. Okay. Uh, there is a lever with a letter T on it down there. What does that do? Besides That's for the convertible top. Oh, I'm thinking turbo. <laughs> uh, not in those days. <laughs> yeah, not in those days. Okay. Now, uh, right below that, you are right to the right here, you got this is just your climate. That's the heater. That's okay. all that is. And you just slide it for. You know, the farther you slide it, the warmer, more, gets. more heat okay, you get. Okay, real basic. Talk to us about the radio. And you got an ashtray. Oh, here. I love that. <laughs> A little lighter right there, yeah. flip out ashtray. Back in these days, everybody had to have ashtrays yep. and lighters, you know. Uh, the radio is interesting. Um, there, uh, The thing I wanted to point out is that these little... Uh, uh, triangles with the circle around them yeah. right here at station yeah. 640 and 1240. That was part of what was called the Conelrad system in America and that had to do with the Cold War and our fear of the Russians coming here to drop nuclear bombs on us. In that event the Conelrad system would get employed and you would turn to one of those spots on your radio dial oh, to get directions on instructions on what to do in the event of a nuclear attack. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> so, and you could go to either one. Yes. But a quick button push told you where it was and wow. The other interesting thing is that if there was a, the Russians were coming with their nuclear bombs and they were gonna attack us and we knew it and they were coming, all radio stations were required to shut off and stop broadcasting so that the Russian planes couldn't hone in on their radio signals and figure out where to drop their bombs. So all radios went silent except Conelrad, and they would just broadcast for about five minutes giving people instructions and then they would go off air and then they would when they come back on they would alternate five minutes on five minutes off but every time they came back on air they would switch frequencies to keep the Russian planes, the bombers, from figuring out exactly where, like I say, to drop the okay. bombs. Interesting system, but that's that. Wow, you'll see that right on in. all car radios from 51 to the mid 60s and some even into the later 60s. What did the lock and the uh, distance button? That's actually a short for local. Okay. And it uh, and then distant, so it's a town and country radio they call it. Okay. And it hones in on local frequencies or you know when you're in driving around town and when you get out in the country I don't know if you're old enough, but when we were kids, we always had to fiddle with the radio because you'd drive for 10 miles and it lose change, your station. Yeah, it would change, yeah, it would change frequently. So that would change so you could pull in uh, distant stations a little easier. Oh, man. 
That is just fascinating. Yeah. Now on the uh, on the dashboard itself, I mean there are there's no, there's no cracks. No, no. Yeah, the dash pad that's factory as well, and there are no cracks. And that steering wheel is, of course, the factory steering wheel. And there, I don't remember. I don't think there's any cracks in that, as I recall. No, at all. Oh man. I mean, I can't believe that. Uh, I mean, that's got to be a vinyl dash. It is, yes. It's in perfect shape. How in the world does that happen? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, a modern car's vinyl dash wouldn't last that long. You come back over 20 years of storage, and it's going to be cracked. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, now, um, the, uh, the back seat is also all original? That's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, hubcaps on the outside are original. The symbols, the emblems up here. Correct. Where the 300C is, that's all original? Yes, it is. Oh, man. I love the tail fins in the course. <laughs> and uh, you can see back. around back on the trunk lid, uh, it has a uh, emblem from Edwards uh, Chrysler in Milwaukee. So this car was originally sold brand new in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, man. And that's where I bought it. The fellow I bought oh, it really? from was just outside of Milwaukee. Interesting. So it lived his most of his life in Milwaukee. It's been there, yeah. Well, it's a good thing you brought to Minnesota. Now it's in the Minnesota, seat. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the trunk was all original. That was in good shape. It was. In the original factory, uh, carpet was in there, and I've kept that. Okay. Although, when the guy stored it away, he put mothballs and I don't know what all in there, but a bunch of stinky stuff to keep the rodents out. Right. And unfortunately, the car, when I got it, it smelled so bad. It was just putrid. And, and so we just took that carpet out of the trunk and I put it in a plastic bag. And I still have it to use as reference to, uh, you know, to getting new carpet made right, that has matching. the same yeah, yeah, yeah. fiber and stuff. But it, it smells bad. So I just took it out of there, you know. Yeah. And, and then the car I've had for, I don't know, five years now, we just left it open in the open air to try to air it, air it out. out and most of that smell has gone away now but it was well, pretty you know, rough. It, I mean it it is amazing to be able to store a car for that long and the mice and rats haven't chewed up all your upholstery. Exactly. So whatever you did might have stunk but it must have worked because yeah. that, that's Moth just crazy. Mothballs and dryer sheets that's what he had all over it. Man. <laughs> He was he was obsessive about keeping this car in good shape. Well, and, and, and he succeeded, didn't he? Yeah, he That's did. That's just yeah. amazing. All right, so what does it ride like? So oh. you, you, you get it all mechanically fixed, so you can actually go for a ride in it. That's the other thing. It's fantastic. There's no rattles. There's no, it doesn't do anything weird. Or I mean, it drives like a perfect brand new car. It floats down the highway and just... Dry, uh, it's it's unbelievable. It brakes straight. It steers straight. It does everything you would expect a new car to do. How it's, many miles does a car have on it? Well, the odometer shows about forty-eight thousand, and I think that's probably right. In fact, I'm quite confident that it's right. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. It would it would be considering how you can get it and drive it, and there's not all that. I mean, mechanically, yeah. it's it's pretty sound. Other than there's the no things you'd expect after any place. Yeah, <laughs> man, just incredible. Yeah. It's so it's so fun, uh, you know, to find these Randy that are uh, all original. Yeah. Um, have you know the only thing you've done is just the few basic things you did just so you could drive it uh, in the engine, but amazing that that has been maintained like that. I mean, that is a that's a little gem right there. Well, a big gem. It is. <laughs> it's not a little car. It is. So what made you get into, uh, was it Chrysler specifically, the Chrysler 300s? Well, when I started collecting cars back in 2005, I thought I was going to get a bunch of Chevys. That was kind of my thing and kind of, I guess, like maybe a lot of people, as I was going to get a 57 and a 55 and a 60 and a, you know, 50 and all right. that kind of stuff. And I did. I do have a 60 Impala that's a very nice car, and I keep it to this day, and I love that car. It's fantastic. And I, anyway, I end up kind of getting steered toward these Chryslers. I didn't know anything about them, and the more I learned about them, the more intriguing they got. And I just thought with the fins and the styling, that Virgil Exner, for me, it's from 57 to 62 are the most beautiful cars, and Chrysler always put enormous engines in them, which is fun. 
but these opulent, sexy interiors with leather seats and and fancy dashboards with very fancy, beautiful gauges and and just they just made beautiful cars that I like to refer as, refer to as sports luxury cars. They're sporty, but they're also luxurious at the same time. They they are beautiful <coughs> on the inside. When you look at the 300 C's and I mean, it just those dashboards are elaborate. It's incredible. Yeah. Now, what kind of an engine does this car have? This one has a Hemi. It's a 392 Hemi, and they just made that for four, or excuse me, two years, uh, 57 okay. and 58. It has two four-barrel carburetors that are in line, and it makes 375 horsepower. Wow, that's a lot for that it, time. It was the most powerful production car in America. Oh, I, I can believe that. That's a, ooh, you're talking mega numbers there for the 57. Wow. And it and goes, then yeah. Transmission was automatic. Automatic, torque flight, three speed. Okay. Yeah. So the, the transmission, when you, when you look inside, you don't see a normal transmission lever. Right. So where is the transmission? It's on the left side there, uh, and it's buttons. Push, push button well, transmission. Push button transmission. I like to then. say typewriter drive, and there is a, fellow that used to say perfect for a left-handed saxophone player <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it's so fun right you see these these things that a lot of people like think are modern because modern cars now just starting in sort of 2019 2020 started coming out with push button transmissions you know you pull or push something and here they were back in the 50s yeah chrysler did it for a number of years uh they started with push buttons in 56 and went all the way to, I'm not even sure how far, but into the middle 60s somewhere. Okay. Yeah. So the question basically is you have a few of these cars and you have restored them to show quality. I mean, you have won multiple awards on many of your cars. So this one's all original. Right. Do you have any plans for it, or are you going to leave it original? I'm going to leave it original. This is just too nice a car to fiddle around with. There's no reason to restore this car at that, all. That it is absolutely stunning, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. This uh, wow piece of artwork sitting there. It's a funny thing about these old cars too. It's you know there's a bunch of sayings. You know they're only original once, that kind of thing. And but but they also drive better. It just seems like. When you restore them, and it doesn't matter how much money you put into them, they're never quite the same. It's just, I don't know, but... And this one is all original, so it drives and rides like it would have out of the showroom floor. Absolutely perfect, yeah. Man. It's just incredible, yeah. So what's one of your favorite memories with this car? Well, I haven't built a lot of memories because we just got it uh, running and driving last summer. After I bought it in 2017... Um, I just left it on my trailer. I couldn't decide what to do with it, and I was afraid to wash the dust off because I thought it would vet devalue the car. Ah. I talked to a lot of people and looked at it and said, I don't know, what would you do if you were me? Would you touch it? Would you get it running? Or would you just leave it? Or what would you do with it? You know, And everybody's like, I don't know, I don't know, but I wouldn't restore it. And so, uh, and there were several people that offered to buy it from me, and I thought about that, because anyway, I couldn't, anyway. And then uh, my restorer, Michael, just goes, let's take that car out of the trailer and get it running. And so I said, okay, and uh, he got it running just last spring, so just a year ago. Okay. And I drove it all around last summer and just had fun. I drove it in a parade in Hopkins with a couple of beauty queens on the back. That was fun. Nice. Um, you know, and I've shown it around a little bit. Mostly I just drive it around. It's so you're just starting to create the memories. Just just starting now, yeah. Okay, so Randy, I happen to notice that you got the Three Stooges pictures inside. What's that for? Well, it's important. The, the Stooges keep me safe and they keep me company. <laughs> I'm a little worried when you say the Stooges keep you safe. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to ride with you. So, so there, there you go. <laughs> well, Randy, thank you so much for taking your time and sharing this beautiful original car with us and the story. Well, thank you, and thanks to all the viewers. It's been fun. Thanks for watching.